What do you do when you start to miss somebody who is dead? Talk about them. Reminisce about the times spent with them. Allow myself to be sad at the dawn. My best friend died in 2015. I miss her a lot. Edit. Holy shit. I did not expect to wake up to such a response to my comment. Thank you for the awards. The kind words about my loss. And additional words of support. Advice. Solidarity and shared loss. First I get sad. And that makes me wish I could have done things differently. And then I remember there are a lot of people in my life who are still alive, but won't be forever. So I check in with them, and try to do and say the things I wish I had done or said with those who died. Miss them. I watched my father die. I was there for his last moments and it's a memory forever ingrained in me those last moments. But when I think of that time which normally saddens me, I immediately think about all the good times we had. The valuable life advice I got from him. And that helps. Edit. First I want to thank you all for sharing your kind words and messages. Sharing your stories and the current phases you are in when it comes to losing someone close to you. There's no magical process or words I can offer any of you to make it better. I can only share from my own experience that it just took time and. Trying to always remember the good times. We both loved wrestling and football. We both loved conversations. We both loved some whiskey and a nice big steak together. Those and many more good memories I hold and cherish. Thank you as well for those of you kind enough to spend some of your hard-earned money to award me as well. I will calculate the amount given and pledge to donate to a local charity. Our forward slash Endless Thread did an amazing episode of their Reddit-centric podcast, Endless Thread, about dealing with loss that was called shipwrecked. In it they shared a post that often graces Reddit that I have come to love in times of loss, as well as its backstory. All right, here goes. I'm old. And so what that means is they've survived so far and a lot of people they've known and loved did not. They've lost friends, best friends, co-workers, acquaintances, grandparents, my mom, relatives, teachers, mentors, students, neighbors, and a host of other folks. But here's my two cents. I wish you could say you get used to people dying. I never did. I don't want to. Tears a hole through me whenever somebody I love dies, no matter the circumstances. But I don't want it not to matter. I don't want it to become something that just passes. Man's voice reading same passage fades in. My scars are a testament to the love and the relationships that I had for and with that person. And if the scar is deep, so was the love. So be it. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are a testament that I can love deeply and live deeply and be cut or even gouged. And that I can heal and continue to live and continue to love and the scar tissue is stronger than the original flesh ever was. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are only ugly to people who can see. As for grief, you'll find that it comes in waves. When the ship is first wrecked, you're drowning with wreckage all around you. Everything floating around you reminds you of the beauty and the magnificence of the ship that was and is no more. And all you can do is float. You find some piece of the wreckage and you hang on. For a while. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe it's a happy memory or a photograph. Maybe it's a person who is also floating. For a while. All you can do is float. Stay alive. In the beginning. The waves are 100 hundred feet tall and they crash over you without mercy. They come 10 seconds apart and don't even give you time to catch your breath. All you can do is hang on and float. After a while, maybe weeks, maybe months, you'll find that the waves are still a 100 feet tall but they come further apart and when they come, they still crash all over you and wipe you out. But, in between, you can breathe and you can function. You never know what's going to trigger the grief. It might be a song or a picture, a street intersection. The smell of the cup of coffee. It can be just about anything. And the wave comes crashing. But in between the waves, there is life. Somewhere down the line, and it's different for everyone, you find that the waves are only 80 feet tall or 50 feet tall. And while they still come, they come further apart and you can see them coming. An anniversary, a birthday, or Christmas, 
or landing at Ohare International. You can see it coming for the most part and you prepare yourself. And when it washes over you, you know that somehow you will, again, come out the other side soaking wet, sputtering, still hanging on to some tiny piece of wreckage, but you'll come out. Take it from an old guy, the waves never stop coming, and somehow you don't really want them to, but you learn that you'll survive them, and other waves will come and you'll survive them, too. If you're lucky you'll have lots of scars from lots of loves, and lots of shipwrecks. It goes on so beautifully. I strongly encourage you to listen to the episode, particularly the last part where the poem is read live. It's worth it. HTTPS forward slash forward slash www.bud.org forward slash endless dread forward slash 2019 forward slash 6 forward slash 14 forward slash shipwrecked. Miss them. Feel. Breathe. Cry. Know that the grief is the other side of love expressing how much you value the deceased, and bringing them alive in you. Thank them. Talk about them. Talk. To. Them. Learn more from your memories of them. Say their name. Gather with others to remember them. Wish them well and invite them to move on. You also have the option to not assume they are. Gone. Conservation of energy is a fundamental law of nature. Continuation of consciousness can be verified throughout life. Sane societies don't assume beings are merely material. In fact, the material aspect is the least real, the most changeable and ephemeral. You can verify this for yourself. The average person eats between 35 and 55 tons of food in a lifetime. The body is constantly changing, 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 but the witnessing awareness has always been there, stable, unaging. The I who saw the Grand Canyon at seven years old and the I, who experiences New York City at 65 are the same. That awareness has not aged. It is like an ageless mirror or movie screen upon which the whole story of life unfolds. Finally, you can use the energy of missing and the poignancy of your memory of the deceased to better wake up to and understand your own impermanence and certain death. You can take steps to live well and completely today, not assuming that even another day will be guaranteed to you or your loved ones, and prepare to die a good death rather than one avoided, rejected, feared as if it's a tragic surprise. Cry. I try to think of something else. I lost my twin sister six years ago to suicide. I never thought of life without her. We came into the world together. I never thought we wouldn't leave together. It is unbearable. Hey op, I've written out this several times on Reddit, on this account and old ones as well, but I'm going to write you out a new response because as you'll find as time passes perspective on death changes over time. When I was 18, my best friend died my first week of college. The grieving process was further complicated since I was unable to attend her funeral. I couldn't pay for my own flight ticket back home and my parents deemed it unnecessary for me to fly back to attend. Then, two years later, my partner, who is, to this day, the only man I've ever truly loved, committed suicide. I know grief like the back of my hand. This is a familiar pain. It is an original pain, but it is not an eternal pain. For a long while after these losses, it felt like they colored my entire world. Every memory, past and present, felt cloaked in incredibly sadness. My waking and dreaming life were completely consumed by mourning and the transition was disorienting. The suddenness and permanence of death carries physical weight. It drains the world of kill. It casts you into a sea of deep, thrashing waves, and you feel powerless to stay afloat above the blackened pitch of it. Submerged in grief, in dreams, in the interstices between awake and dreaming where you realize at the outset of every new day that this is, in fact, real it levels you. It is no mistake that people who talk about grief liken it to a feeling of drowning, of becoming a husk of your former self, of being completely helpless to combat a loss that feels more like a piece of you has been bought out and taken away than it does something external. The fact is, we are undone by each other. We are undone by grief. 
We are undone by the person we lost and the pieces of ourselves they take with them when they go. Grief touches everything. It may feel like it has taken everything, too, but it hasn't. It has only taken what was not what is, not what will be. As your life grows, so too does the space around your grief. As the architect of our own lives and futures, it may take some time to start writing the chapters after after all. Grief immerses us in the before. But one day, you will have a moment in which you realize you are no longer in the water, in those hungry waves. You aren't consumed. You don't feel the weight. Maybe you're watching a movie with friends, or taking a bike ride, or working on art. Maybe it's a beautiful day and the sun shines down on you and you think for the first time. This can be okay. Those moments are beacons that draw us out of the inner corridors inside of ourselves, back into the world of the living. They are brief new chapters we have written in the storybook of our survival, and they become longer and brighter over time. We start to build a life around grief, or rather, we build a life outside of it. The chapters we write become about the living, not just about the dead. They are revisions of our former selves. They are a roadmap to survival. As the chapters grow in length and size, so too does our ability to live without the punishing weight of grief. It becomes smaller. It feels more like a sea inside a landscape than the water you find yourself dragged by in every moment. We explore the terrain, and we find there are ways to mourn the dead and call the living. Vivos voco, mortuos plango. The truth is, the grief never leaves us. It has been nine years since my partner died, eleven since my best friend. On long bike rides, on rainy evenings sitting on my front stoop smoking, and on bridges. When I look over the edge and see the water beneath me pulsing with the tide, I whisper little messages to them. I am carrying you with me through this wide and wild world. I talk about them to my new friends, so that the people in my life know who they were and why they were important. I share pictures and stories. I let myself wade in the grief. Sometimes, I submerge myself in it, and I know that that, too, is okay. There is no roadmap for mourning. Oh, it is a labyrinthine journey into ourselves, a story we continue to write through the passage of time and through distance from the original pain. There is no finishing, there is only revision. In a decade, you will look back, and you will know what you have lost, but it will just be a shade of the things you know, feel, and have now. Let yourself feel this loss. Let yourself be swallowed by it. Know that this is okay, and know, too, that you are also grieving the pieces of yourself that were lost, too. God seed. Oh, less than three. Edit. Holy sheet. Thank you guys for all of the golds and other awards. There are so many awards now. What do they all mean? Am I really a timeless beauty, as one award would imply? Or am I hideously deformed? Forward slash. Who can say? Since I'm making this edit anyway, I wanted to add something for those of you who wish to help someone else who is grieving. 1. Sentiment isn't always the best approach. Please don't resort to empty platitudes especially not, everything happens for a reason, or this will make you stronger types, as they can be insulting, patronizing, and unhelpful. My best advice is to contribute acts of service, to those in mourning, cook for them, clean their house, do their laundry, babysit their kids, take their dogs for a walk, the small things build up, the depression of grief hollows us out. The things I remember most from after these losses were the friends who swooped into my life and just made sure I was taken care of. Rides. Help with homework. A long drive with no destination, and no forced conversation. One friend of mine took me out to the mountains, laid down a huge tarp, and lined up glass bottles and old VCR tapes for me to smash with a golf club and a baseball bat. Don't worry. We recycled the detritus afterwards by simply gathering up the tarp. What resources do you have that you can rally for this person? Use them. People in mourning receive a lot of platitudes and condolences but often don't receive much real world. Help. Be the helper. Be a positive presence. Shoulder some of the burden so that they don't drown in more than just their grief. 2. Include the grieving person as often as possible. 
Invite them to parties. Invite them for solo hangs. Expect and be okay with hearing a lot of no's at first, but don't stop reaching out. Socialization is important during this period of time. It's not enough to just text, call, show up, give space if it's asked for but don't give up. Involve them in activities. Do an art project together. Shower them with plants. Take a walk on a sunny day. Be okay with silence and conversation. Make it comfortable. Meet them where they're at. That is what good friends do. This is how you can help. Less than three. I fucking love you all. You are such kind people. Don't ever give up hope. And never stop helping one another. Subscribe, like and comment if you hate outros begging you to subscribe, like and comment.